the Harappans, the Aryans. Who are we Indians? Where did we come from? As informative as it is unsettling, this book shakes many age-old beliefs and makes us understand who we really are, putting to rest many frivolous debates on the origin of India and Indians. Let's get talking to Tony Joseph, veteran journalist and author of this great book, Early Indians. Thank you, Shipi. Very happy to be here. Really happy to have you here, sir. This book has had me reading it for like 48 hours at length without me taking a break. So it was fun reading it. And I really wish you had written my history books. Thank you. Seriously, because the simplicity with which you've explained the basics of archaeology, anthropology, linguistics, genetics, and so much more, the ease with which I could actually understand a lot of technicalities involved, you know, uh, with me being a layman was uh, really all thanks to you. And I'm sure many people who have no interest in history whatsoever would actually find this book really relevant and uh, an easy read. So yes, congratulations for that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. So first questions first, why this book? Uh, uh, two answers, two parts to the answer. One part is that uh, prehistory has always fascinated me, and particularly the Harappans. And uh, ever since I knew about that there is, uh, about the Harappan civilization, I have, whenever I have come across anything at all on related to the Harappan civilization, I would never leave it. Because for some reason it has always fascinated me. And the questions about who were the Harappans, where did they come from, and equally importantly, why did it take more than a thousand years for a civilization and urbanism to come back in the Indian subcontinent after their civilization declined? Uh, there were no answers. So about uh, five, six years ago, uh, I thought, let me try and answer these questions about the Harappans. And uh, with the latest findings from across uh, history, uh, archaeology, linguistics, whatever I could find. So I started visiting all the Harappan sites uh, of which Dholavira and Gujarat, which, which if you haven't been there, you should. It's, a, it's an amazing site. Uh, Lothal again in Gujarat, Rakhigadi in Haryana. And each visit followed by conversations and uh, visits with archaeologists, linguists, epigraphists, people who have worked on some of the sites and uh, have written papers. So these visits and meetings answered many of my questions. But they would always end with even more questions than one had. So then you realize that uh, you cannot really answer the questions about the Harappans until you came to grips with periods that were thousands of years earlier and, uh, and that at least a few hundred years after the Harappans. So this is around the time when you started realizing that some of the answers to these questions uh, were coming from a completely new field that was new to me then called population genetics. And the population genetics was throwing up interesting answers, not just for Indian prehistory, but for prehistory all around the world. And this is around the time when I realized that my book had changed character altogether, that it was no longer about who were the Harappans. It was more about who were we, the Indians. And uh, the, the genetic findings, the, population, the findings of population genetics were very fascinating. And it became even more substantial when about a, three or four years ago, geneticists started having the ability, acquired the ability to uh, analyze and understand ancient DNA, or that's the DNA of people who lived thousands or tens of thousands of years ago, which then allowed them to actually see on the ground how migrations happened. Because if you have uh, ancient DNA from, let's say, from the same location, at 4,000 years ago, and 2,000 years ago, and 1,000 years ago, and then you can see how the, how their ancestry changed. Then you have get a reasonably clear clue as to how populations moved from where and when. So this was a very dramatic. This has made a dramatic difference to our understanding of prehistory across Europe, the Americas, East Asia, Central Asia, South Asia, and so what's happening in South Asia today, which is uh, in terms of our understanding of our own prehistory, is only one part of the radical re uh, revision of prehistory that is going on across the world. What was the kind of reader that you had in mind while penning this book? Uh, someone like me, 
I was an outsider to all of these disciplines, and that I was coming in as a uh, as a newcomer, try, willing and willing to give the time and make the effort to understand it. Uh, I think uh, helped me ask the questions that are normally not asked in uh, in normal. Uh, more normal history books. Uh, so there was this uh, interesting note that I found here, and I read: In the rather short history of Homo sapiens, just around 300,000 years, compared to the 3.8 billion years that there has life be, uh, there's been life on Earth, each of our tribes, clans, kingdoms, empires, and nations have considered themselves to be of superior status. So much so that you add on. People also thought that the spot of earth that they occupied was at the center of it all. That's right. <laughs> That's absolutely right. I think... Uh... So this is, this is not just us or today's generation. We've always been so full of ourselves. Absolutely. Absolutely self-absorbed. And we think uh, that uh, the view of the world that we get from exactly where we are is the only valid view of the world and everything else is distorted or partial and this has been happening like ever since that, that that's right i don't yeah I, I think it takes a special effort a special understanding to get out of it so i don't think we will be over it anytime soon either <laughs> okay and uh, you've also talked about uh, you know how in the most professional of settings personal preferences still play a role in matters of research findings this came as a surprise to me this is not something that i expected to find and when I found it I was also not willing to accept that this is the case but there is no denying the fact that personal preferences and biases do play a part I'll, I'll phrase it carefully do play a part in how scientific findings are interpreted I wouldn't say that yet say that uh, they influence the scientific findings themselves but they are how they are interpreted are uh, dependent to a large extent on personal preferences and biases. Uh, some of the uh, geneticists who have worked in India and other parts of the world uh, have told me that how scientists are exuberant when the results tend to go one way and, uh, and are not so exuberant as, and are sullen when the results go, tend to go the other way, which is not something that he finds in other countries because in many other countries that I'm sure there are countries where it's a situation the same. But in many countries, people don't really bother about prehistory all that much. If you said, this is, this is what, uh, you know, people came from here and there, and that's how the population formed, they would be interested. But it is not something that would affect them personally to be, to be either uh, thrilled by the findings or, 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 or affected badly by the findings. The fact that there are so many of us feel uh, uh, that you're, there's a lot at stake in prehistory. Uh, I think it has its impact on uh, how in, if findings are interpreted as well. It should cease to be so, and I hope it will cease to be so, because we should remember that all Indian populations are mixed. There are no, there are no pure populations. I mean, the, the, the idea of race is meaningless. I mean, not just in India, anywhere else, in, anywhere in the world. So I think many of this. Uh, uh, personal preferences come from, uh, it's likely that they come from identification with particular groups or ancestries. It's time we should realize that uh, we are all mixed and we are all migrants. So you talked about our disdain for scheduled castes, scheduled tribes, our uh, general unconcern for our own prehistorical sites, which includes uh, Dhalavira and uh, Lavira, Jwalapuram, Bhimetka. Okay. And you've also talked about our uh, failure to understand the, you know, um, to understand the basics in terms of uh, different eating habits, different, uh, you know, different appearances between the South or the North Indians. A lot of things that you've tried to talk about which happen to form like very strong notions amongst uh, Indians today which you know uh, which takes me back to the first question that i asked you as to why is it that you wrote this book was this also somewhere at the back 
of your mind to highlight these things more to so as to crush a couple of myths a couple of misconceptions and a lot of biases that we have you know as as a community at large it's 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 true that i wanted to answer these questions in the backdrop of all that you mentioned that uh, that many of the ways in which uh, many of the social our social ills come from the way that we understand uh, our history so i wanted to know what is the what is the true history is it is what we understand it uh, is that the correct thing or are there is there more to under, more to uh, more to it than what we know so i did not go into it knowing the answers uh, i went into it knowing knowing the questions but is this true is this true is this true so it has been a journey of discovery for me as well in the years that has been spent on it but yes these questions are the the this i felt the need one felt the need to answer these questions because they are central to many of the, to to the way we see ourselves and we behave with each other as indians so it's important to put uh, uh facts before the public so that they know that many of our assumptions about ourselves are not based on facts and therefore they need to be revised so yeah but uh, the only the only only change that i would make to you i did not go into it knowing what the answers are going to be okay now that we're talking about it would you want to give us a quick short chronology of where we um, exactly how we came into being if there is one sentence that can summarize the whole book it is that the indian population is formed out of four ancient prehistoric migrations the first one the out of africa migrants uh, which went on to populate this is one migration as you might know which went on to populate all of the rest of the world from africa uh, they came out of africa around 70000 years ago and they reached the indian subcontinent around 65000 years ago and the book calls them the first indians uh, they are the first modern humans or to use the more scientific term homo sapiens uh in the subcontinent but there were other homo species before them so they did not come into an empty land inviting empty land there were others who were quite like them uh in fact we today think of the homo other homo species as very inferior to us that's not true they are quite like us and in fact some of them had bigger brains than us we made the same kind of tools and in fact uh, we also now know that we interbred with each other so when you say other homo uh, species or archaic humans were there it's not that some other kind of uh, these are people quite like us in many ways so and there was an already existing robust population of uh, homo species in, in in india when the modern humans our ancestors arrived uh, by around it took a long time initially they kept out of the way of the other homo species but over time as the book says how they spread over the subcontinent by around 35000 you could say they were the masters of all that they saw in in uh, in this in this region the second migration happened uh, around 7 9000 years ago or earlier and these were people from west asia or the zagros region of iran who reached india mixed with the first indians and it is this mixed population that spread the first uh, agricultural revolution across the northwestern region of india it's possible that the first indians were already experimenting with agriculture when the west asians arrived uh, so it is not to suggest that agriculture began with the arrival of uh, west asians but it is quite clear that it is the combined population of first indians the mixed population that did act as a major catalyst to the expansion of agriculture uh in northwestern india this is the second major migration and just as the out of africa migration is something that left its mark all over the world the second migration is also a part of a global trend in the sense that uh, wherever agriculture began wherever modern humans transitioned into agriculture from hand gathering there was very major huge population expansion that led to major migrations it happened in not just in out of west asia that happened out of uh china everywhere people took to took to uh, agriculture in a big way uh, it happened major migrations happened so this is the second migration of people into india 
The third uh, major uh, migration happened from East Asia. That's around or after 2000 BCE, about uh, 4000 years ago, when uh, East Asians brought in Austroasiatic languages, uh, Austroasiatic language speaking people to India. And uh, these are languages like Khasi and Mundari, which are spoken by tribals in Central India and uh, Eastern India. And they might have also brought new, new uh, farming practices and plants and a variety of rice also with them to India. So this is the third major migration. Uh, the fourth migration, which my book calls the last migrants, last migration, is the only one over which there is a discernible a political heat. Nobody really bothers about the other three migrations, which it's, which it's re revealing in, in its own way. The last major migration is from the Central Asian steppe, and this brought around between 4,000 and 3,000 years ago, and this brought uh, Indo-European language speaking people, who called themselves Aryans, uh, who were masters in, uh, in, in, in who, who, who had significant skills in metallurgy, and were horse riding pastoralists who were warrior like. And uh, South Asian, their arrival in South Asia was preceded because they did move into Europe almost a thousand years earlier, around 5,000 years ago. So 5,000 years ago, they moved to uh, Europe, uh, changing their demography and the language is spoken in Europe. And around uh, 4,000 years ago, they moved into South Asia, significantly impacting the demography of the Indian subcontinent as well as giving it the largest spoken family of languages in India today. So this is the expansion of the pastoralists from Central Asia that explains the spread of Indo-European languages across the world, from uh, Iceland at one end to India at the other end. There are no populations to the east of India that speak Indo-European languages. So India is effectively the, the last frontier of the spread of Indo-European languages across. So these are the four major migrations that form the Indian population. Now, the next thing, if I may go further, is to you say... You may also include yeah. your uh, pizza theory in this only. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, uh, so the important thing to remember is that no matter... There is a significant uh, mixing has happened between all four major migrations. And today you can clearly say that no, no matter where in the caste hierarchy you are, what language you speak, which region you inhabit, what religion you follow, you, your population group is most likely to have 50 to 65 percent of the ancestry of first Indians, that is people who came here uh, 65,000 years ago. So that is absolutely surprising because uh, even a few years ago we used to ask, right, where you know the first first people, who, the first Indians, or the first people who arrived in India, where can we find them? Where did they go? We know the answer is, look in the mirror. Because 50 to 65 percent of the ancestry of most population groups in India comes from the first Indians. That's a stunning new revelation. What it also means is that the tribals, for example, are not somehow very different from the rest of the Indian population as uh, many people think or believe. In fact, there's no one that we share, uh, all, pop all, pop all parts of the population share as much ancestry with, with as the tribals. The tribals are us in, us in inverted commas. So I think these kind of, uh, uh, many of the assumptions that we make about ourselves are no longer, can no longer hold because genetics has, uh, has destroyed many of those assumptions. The pizza analogy uh, is essentially says that uh, the, the, the Indian uh, demography, Indian population is like a, like a pizza with the foundation or the base being, uh, being the, that, the ancestry of the first Indians because without it there is no pizza. That's the foundation, that's the base. Uh, and as I said, that forms 60 to 65 percent of the ancestry of most Indian population groups. On top of that comes the sauce and the sauce is the Harappans. Why the Harappans? Because the Harappans who themselves are a mixture of first Indians and West Asians, they spread all over the subcontinent. Uh, when their civilization declined, they, so they went all over to the east towards what is North India and to the south towards South India in search of new fertile land. 
and uh, so therefore they just became the ancestors of both North Indians and South Indians. Uh, and the, the there, there's a in many ways you could say that the Harappans are the cultural glue that holds India together because we don't often realize that how many of the current practices and belief systems that we today have might be might flow from the practices and beliefs uh, that first were experimented with in the crucible of the, in the Harappan crucible. So that's the uh, that's the continuity, that's the influence that the Harappan civilization has wielded. The third, uh, you could say, the cheese. It could perhaps be the Arya who came from uh, from from Central Asia around 4,000 years ago. They are not spread uniformly across the whole uh, subcontinent. It, there's more in some regions and less in some regions, but it is spread all over. And then, of course, the toppings, whether it's the Austro-Asiatic language speakers and all the other uh, migrations that happened in historic and later on and in historic times, these, these may not have left a large enough genetic mark on the Indian population, but they did leave a large cultural mark, whether these are the Jews, the, Pars, uh, the Parsis, the, all the, uh, the Huns, the Shakas, uh, the Greeks, the Persians, the Arabs, I think all of them have left a significant mark on the Indian, pop Indian population in cultural terms, but not in genetic terms. They all form the the toppings of the pizza. So that's the uh, that's that's the Indian pizza that I, that that the book talks about. So the entire population out of Africa, you see, has uh, originated from one single African woman who originated the L3 empty DNA chromosome and likewise for a man who originated the Y chromosome CT haplogroup. Tell us about this magic of genetics. Uh, yeah, I think uh, the, 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 the finding that all of the non-African populations around the world, whether they are Indians, West Asians, Americans, wherever they, wherever they are, they are they are all ultimately come from a single migration out of Africa around seventy thousand years ago. Uh, and it was first proposed. It was quite a uh, stunning revelation. Uh, but genetics is is clear on this that you can you 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 can you can figure out the ancestry of the rest of the uh, non-African populations, and they do come from. Uh, from a single, from a small part of the uh, of the Af African population, the rest of the Af African populations are not are not reflected in the in, in in the people that have populated the rest of the world. Uh, so therefore, yes, in if you whether if you follow the mtDNA haplogroup, which is the hap, which is the uh, the ancestry that goes down the uh, maternal line from mother to daughter to daughter and so on. And the Y chromosome, which is that ancestry that comes from father to son to son, etc. Both of these things, if you check, you'll find that they come from uh, the maternal ancestry comes from a uh, from a woman who would have lived African woman who would have lived about uh, seventy or seventy five thousand years ago. And Mehergarh, you say, laid the foundation for the Harappan civilization. Yes. Tell us about the first farmers. Mehrgarg is in uh, Baluchistan in today's Pakistan and uh, it's the place from where we get the earliest evidence of agriculture. There is also evidence of agriculture from a place called Nahura Deva in uh, Uttar Pradesh today uh, by where we have the, we have both around 7000 BCE or 9000 years ago. We can see uh, in Nahura Deva we can see evidence of experimentation with rice harvesting whether it but it doesn't we don't have evidence later of it moving into rice cultivation and rice based civilization arising in Lahuta Deva but Harappa, uh, but Mohin, but uh, Mergarg is uh, is not like that you have ex uh, evidence of ex experimentations in agriculture that they are then going on that's in wheat and barley not rice that they are going on to lead the foundation for uh, agricultural revolution that also spreads. cotton and copper. Yes, later on it adds the arts. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It, the way it spreads across the entire region, which later on becomes a higher civilization, is stunning on the, and it is visible on the archaeological record. 
and uh, we should realize that yes, it laid the foundation for the Harappan civilization, and the Harappan civilization is we often don't realize it is the largest civilization of its time, as big as the Egyptian and Mesopotamian civilizations put together, both in area and in the number of uh, populi and, and the population size. And it would today it would be about one third the size of India today. And considering that they had, uh, unlike many other civilizations, they had uh, quite, quite a lot of areas uh, in which they had standardization, whether it's the size of the bricks, whether it's the weights and measures, uh, the, the, the script, so there, uh, and the way the, uh, sit, uh, the cities are largely built. So there are, considering the number of things that they had standardized, it is amazing how without uh, any uh, anything that is even remotely comparable to modern day communication, travel, or anything at all. How it was so urban and is, so progressive uh, back then. Yes. So yes, the, so Mahargaha is uh, the discovery of Mahargaha was a huge step forward in our understanding of how the Harappan civilization came about and how the agriculture began in the Indian subcontinent. And sir, uh, the Harappan civilization was not an offshoot of Mesopotamian civilization, nor did it have anything to do with the Aryans or Sanskrit or the Vedas. The Mesopotamian civilization, like like many uh, uh, many archaeologists who first discovered the Harappan civilization, thought that it is an offshoot of the, but that's not so because we can see we can see the Harappan civilization, uh, you know, growing up from the boots uh, from the ground up. Uh, so there is no surprise that it ended up where it is. There's also no, no doubt that there were significant uh, cultural and trade links between Mesopotamian civilizations and the Harappan civilizations, and they influenced each other. Both sides, uh, they influenced each other. Uh, but they in, were both quite interrelated, still very unique in their own Very world. unique, and, uh, and in very fundamental ways. For example, uh, you can see across the Mesopotamian civilization, you can see large temples, what they call ziggurats, and they're, that, that, that they're essential to the, the, to the coming into being of the cities. There's nothing similar in the Harappan civilization. And you can see that the Mesopotamian civilization, or even the Egyptian one, the, the, the king, the yeah, all powerful they glorify king, their king they, they glorify their we don't do anything of that kind. Uh, we don't have royal burials where somebody is buried with huge treasures or, or as in the West Asia, even with their servants. We don't do that. So it is very clear that we that, that the Harappan civilization had impulses, cultural impulses that are very totally different from anything else that was around then. Or the investment that went into public conveniences. That's also stunning. That's not something that you easily find elsewhere. So the value system of the Harappan civilization, we can clearly say was very different from those of the rest, rest of the civilizations around that time. Uh, and it is also very different, as we can see later, uh, from the Vedic uh, culture, which, come, which, which uh, comes after, as we now know, now know from uh, genetic evidence, uh, which comes after the Harappan civilization starts declining around 4,000 years ago. Uh, the differences between the two are quite striking. In fact, my book talks about, for example, uh, in the Harappan civilization, the archaeologists who, who, who excavated Tholavira, uh, Aras Bisht, for example, talks about evidence of phallus worship in, in the Harappan civilization, including in Tholavira and other uh, Harappan cities. But there is, in the earliest of the Vedas, Rig Veda, there is uh, evidence of, uh, there is, there, there is, you can see that there is severe distaste towards the idea of phallus worship. And, uh, and and the Veda wants them to be kept away from the uh, from the sacred things and sacred worship. But that uh, that goes away over a period of time. So what's happening is that there is an early disconnect between the Harappan civilization and the incoming uh, Arya uh, civilization that ha that happened over the next few centuries. And uh, but that difference goes away over over a period of time as the two cultures mingle, adopt, and adapt each other's practices and beliefs and influence each other in a very significant manner. That is the, uh, that's how the Indian culture, religion, beliefs have evolved over time. Does God exist? If you ask me, no. I don't think that the, 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 the need for God exists and therefore the God doesn't exist.
there's no need for him to accept. Uh, uh, there's almost no uh, nothing that is not explainable by science, uh, except maybe the very beginning of matter itself, because the beginning of life itself has ceased to be such as a, anywhere near the mystery that it used to be. So if at all there is any mystery left, it's the mystery that's about how did matter originate. So to that extent, the need for a god has uh, weakened to the point of being non-existent, I would say. Uh, you're still in the process of discovering more and more and, you know, uh, figuring out more about where we originated, uh, not just in terms of us Indians, but also, you know, the world history. Yeah. So I can hope for a sequel to this book. There definitely is one, at least in the pipeline. Okay. And uh, when is that expected? Uh, no, that I don't want to, considering how long it took last time, I don't want to give a commitment, but it will not be anywhere near as long as that. We look forward to reading the sequel. Thank you, thank and you very much. Wish you all the best. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your time.